Hey guys, it's YXBA. Welcome to the first segment of my interview with Dennis Dyack of Quantum Entanglement Entertainment. If you like this video and want to hear even more conversation with me, Dennis Dyack, Phil Hames, and Embarcus, please check out the podcast on the Quantum Tunnel YouTube channel. I will leave a link in the description below. All right, I will take you directly to the first segment of my interview with Dennis Dyack, the creator of Eternal Darkness, one of the greatest games made on the Nintendo GameCube. So I thought that we would start by just having you maybe give a little bit of a rundown of your history as a game developer, maybe talk a little bit about some of the games that you've made in the past, as well as your connection to Nintendo. Sure. So let's see. I, I've been in the video game industry now for almost 30 years, and I've I started making games back when I was doing my undergraduate in computer science at Brock University, and my first game was published back in 1991, and it was called Cyber Empires. It was published on the Atari, the Amiga, and the PC. That's how far back it goes. <laughs> yeah, so, and this was, this was kind of funny, believe it or not. It really was like the Total War franchises today, where we had like this risk board. I love strategy games. And so there's like this risk board where you take over countries, only you would fight with robots or mechs, like Battletech. And it was split screen because there was no internet at the time. And you would play hot seat, and then when when you would actually fight for the countries in real time, it would be split screen on the monitor or the TV or, you know, depending on what you're playing. And it won multiplayer game of the year by Computer Gaming World at the time. So it would it's it's one of those funny things, and that was our first game. And we did that even before Silicon Knights was incorporated. So after that, we incorporated Silicon Knights. Um, went on to do Fantasy Empires, which was a similar type game based on the Dungeons and Dragons license. And from there, we went on and did an Archon homage. Archon is one of my favorite games of all time. I know this is going way far back, but called Dark Legions, in which really, in in many ways, led the way to the type of games I do now, which are story based games. We the game itself was essentially like set up like a chessboard. We had all these different fantasy and fantastical creatures and dark. It was dark fantasy. And uh, you'd move them on the boards and then you'd fight real time when they both hit the same squares. And the interesting thing about that game was when we were designing it and making it, part of the marketing was we were making we, we made these player cards. This was before card games were even big. And they were just cards and write little history about the world and stuff. And we had so much fun doing that. I sort of looked at the company overall and said, I think we should go in a direction where we start doing storytelling, things based on story and narrative. I enjoyed it so much, so then we started thinking about creating Legacy of Cain to Human and all of those things, and that's when those concepts were created, right after Dark Legions. And so from there, we went on to do Legacy of Cain, which was our first console game, so we moved away from the Amigas and the, the PCs. I thought back then the Atari was going to rule the world because it was the best hardware at the time, and... Uh, <laughs> was totally wrong. It's got nothing to do with who's got the best hardware. It's got to do with marketing and other factors that are virtually almost impossible to, you know, predict. Yeah. So, wait a minute. Are you suggesting that Atari was better hardware than the original Nintendo? I'm not suggesting that, but I'm suggesting... So, I was talking about the Atari computer. Oh, okay. Not the console. Yeah. And so, so I, I came at things from the PC side. And I would say, in retrospect now, definitely the best computer at the time was the Amiga. It did full multitasking. So the Amiga was the best hardware. But I thought before I even worked on the Amiga, we started everything on the Atari, that the best hardware was going to win out. And the PC in comparison was really awful, actually. <laughs> it was not meant for playing games. And I thought there's no way the Atari or the Amiga would lose to this. And it did. Yeah, they, they were eventually wiped out. So so yeah, I come from the originally come from the PC world, not the console world. And so when I'm talking about I thought it was the best hardware, I'm not referring to the days of Nintendo consoles and stuff. And so our jump into the console world started with Legacy of Kane and the PS1. Okay. 
So that was your first console game. That yeah, was our first console game. Yeah. I find it a little bit interesting because I I've actually you know watched some documentaries and and whatnot lately on the video game industry and my understanding is that when the Nintendo the original Nintendo came out it actually had some improvements that you could do some things that you, they hadn't even figured out how to do on PC yet at that time like side scrolling for example and then i think That's it correct. was John Carmack with Commander Kane i think it was who figured when they actually figured out how to do that on PC yeah correct um i think that showed early signs of where Nintendo really real strengths are is that it was making it understood intuitively in some sense what was good with making games because you know don't forget they started with the arcades and were able to make hardware that were reflective of the games that they were trying to make where the PC was just this mishmash of hardware thrown together that frankly was extremely extremely difficult to program for at first it just simply wasn't made for games. Yeah, I find that I find it interesting that like Nintendo has usually done a, a really really good job of marrying the hardware together with the software, and I think probably the Wii is probably one of the best examples of them doing something really really different, and it pretty much totally working the way they intended. But I have a little bit of uh, concern with the Wii U in terms of it not really doing what they intended it to be able to do. So. You know, as a big Nintendo fan, the Wii U kind of concerns me a bit. Like, if you've played Star Fox Zero on there, I think find out pretty quickly that the whole concept that they had for that system didn't end up working as well as they had hoped. You know, I find it very interesting that with the new Zelda game, I think it was either Miyamoto or Aonuma had recently said that they basically pulled out all of the extra gamepad functionality because it's actually disruptive to the gameplay to have to look back and forth between the two screens. So I hope I'm hoping that that is just a little bit of an aberration for Nintendo. I wouldn't call it an aberration. So well, let me say a lot of things. First of all, I think there's absolutely nothing to fear, and I would call the Wii the most successful disruptive piece of video game hardware ever to come out in history of video games. It really changed a lot of stuff. And it went in a direction that no one was thinking, and they dominated the market for a while. And before that, when you look at the GameCube, which is one of my favorite pieces of hardware of all time, there you have a system that's ex built exceedingly well for a really good price that hit all the marks. And someone who developed on that system, I, ca I can't tell you how much we loved it. It had great great things going for it and when you look at the Wii U that's just an example of Nintendo willing to experiment to try to shake things up in a way that will move the marketplace forward and and you know certainly they want to move the marketplace forward for them but they're really trying different things they're trying things that other people won't do and was it as successful as they wanted well no of course not but I don't think that's a, an area of concern because I think they've said it, that they're now taking things in another direction. I am extremely excited for the new hardware in the new direction, frankly, and, and feel very yeah. confident that they'll, they'll be going in good directions. So. Yeah, me too. Well, what they said at their annual general meeting, I think it was last week, that their, their mission statement has changed. It used to be about basically broadening the gaming market uh, with their hardware, and now... They're all about broadening their IP to as many people as it possibly can reach, whether that's within their hardware or without. So I, to me, that's really exciting because I don't like the idea of trying to use their dedicated hardware to please absolutely everybody. Like, I, I want to see them, okay, so they want to make some money off of the casual market and, and, and get their name out there, do animes, do mobile games, do all that stuff. But I want their console to be targeting more like the, the bigger Nintendo fan rather than just anybody. But maybe it's just wishful thinking at this point, but we'll, I guess we'll have to wait and see what it is. I think that's a really smart direction, frankly. Uh, one of the things that's happened in the video game industry that I don't think many people could have predicted is that through commoditization and uh, proliferation of cell phones, that has really brought in the hardware market. So more people play games now than ever before, 
but not as many people are playing console games like they used to. As a matter of fact, the mobile market is much, much bigger than the console market now, is, if, if I understand the numbers right. And so what that means is, for Nintendo, is they don't have to do, they don't have to try to broaden the market anymore. The market's already been broadened by pieces of hardware that they didn't create. So now what they can do is take advantage of these new areas. And I've always said that their strength is software and creating great games. And, and to hear that, you know, warms my heart because uh, the more people play Nintendo games, the better off the better off the industry is because they make the best stuff out there, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, for sure. Well, I want to let you. Sorry, I, I I got excited and we started going in a new direction here, but I want to let you finish. We yeah, sure, sure, no problem. Um, we created Legacy of Kane on the PlayStation, and then from there, we went on to start to work with Nintendo, and we were originally working on the N64. We were doing all kinds of tests and mock-ups and. We were doing all kinds of pitches, and at one point, when we were kicking around some ideas, and I was getting, I was getting ready to go pitch what I thought would be the ideas that would we would be working with Nintendo on. Resident Evil 2 came out, and being super excited about games, I stayed up two nights in a row. I didn't sleep for two days, <laughs> and then hopped on a plane and went to Seattle, where Nintendo of America was, to start thinking about these ideas. And when I got there. Henry Sturchy was the producer at the time, uh, working with us at Nintendo of America. And <laughs> he looked at me and was like, what is wrong with you? You look terrible. And I was like, yeah, I stayed up all night playing Resident Evil 2. And then we just started talking about because he loved it as well. We started talking about how great it was. I really liked the different storylines, how you could see them from different perspectives. And I thought that was really unique at the time for video games. And... I was in love with that idea, and then we started kicking around, and I, Henry was like, why don't we do a horror game, and, you know, along the lines of something like that, and I was like, yeah, and we started you know, kicking around Lovecraft, and and the thing is, you know, working with Nintendo, you never, ever, ever wanted, to, like, we didn't want to do Resident Evil. First of all, Capcom was doing a great job with it. I still love the Resident Evils today, and... So we didn't try to create a Resident Evil. We wanted to create a different kind of game that was a horror game, but not a survival horror that really focused on different timelines and different storylines. And that's how Eternal Darkness was born. So, you know, worked away at the pitch, came back, fully rested, <laughs> and everyone loved it. Everyone loved it, you know, because you start Nintendo of America, then you have to go to Japan, and they really liked what we were doing. So, of course, we, we got all the way to Alpha on the N64. We were doing things 640 by 480, without the memory card, which was incredible for the time with the N64 because I didn't have a lot of RAM. And I remember even doing a pitch in front of Mr. Miyamoto and about 10 other people from Nintendo of Japan, and they, as we were doing the demo, they would actually go over and check to see if the memory card was in the <laughs> dev kit. And then they told us that they had not seen anyone ever do that before. And so we were really proud of the sort of technical achievements we did all for it. All for it to be changed that one night when Henry called me up and he's, he actually said, this is one of those few calls when someone says, are you sitting down? He literally said that. And I was like, no, but I guess I will. And he goes, uh, I think we need to move uh, Eternal Darkness uh, to the GameCube. And I was shocked because we were so close to getting finished. And so we had to rewrite everything from scratch and the game got delayed. And But, you know, it ended up coming out for the GameCube, which we love the GameCube hardware. It was fantastic. And in retrospect, it was the right move. Because we could do so many more things with it. Refresh rates were faster. We were uh, allowed higher textures. The gameplay was smoother. There's just so many great things about it. So, and that's you know some some sort of top level history on Eternal Darkness. And that's how we we really got to know Nintendo. And during the development of Eternal Darkness, Nintendo liked working with us so much. That's when we started discussions where they bought part of the company, and we were very very aligned. We really liked their development process and the way that they looked at games. And, and to be clear, there's really two types of publishers out there. And the one is one type is very rare, and the other type is most publishers. So, and what they are is, one is marketing focused, where they will spend advertising dollars and whatever it takes to get their game to be successful. And those are marketing driven companies. So you'll spend, I'll just throw a number of, say spend $10 million on the game. You'll literally spend four to five times that on marketing to make sure the game is good. Those are called marketing-driven companies. The rarer type 
is development driven companies where the development groups, the people who make the games lead the company and the marketing groups will assist them in making those games successful. Nintendo is like that. Um, very, there are very few companies that are like that. And what tends to happen is when you're creating hardware, when you're going in the right direction, which makes me so excited for the NX, that they're looking, they're forward thinking into the into what can make the games the best, and they know games. Whereas in marketing-driven companies, you will often get marketing people making decisions regardless of the direction of the hardware, whether the hardware can do it. There were decisions made like in previous generations where people say, okay, we're going to high def when no one was ready for high def. And that's when you know people were like, well, why am I only get, can barely get 30 frames per second on this piece of hardware? It's because the hardware wasn't designed to do it. But the marketing groups will say, we're going high def, we'll sell more cop, we'll sell more units. And, yeah. you know, and, and so that's, you know, that's Nintendo and that's why they're so awesome. Yeah, like I'm really hoping that with Nintendo, or at least my, my, the way I view it is it's kind of becoming like iOS versus Android. You'll often see like the, on the Android side of things, because you have all these different companies basically competing to make, you know, a similar phone, right? It's all about benchmarks and and things of that nature. They'll make it 1080p screen and they'll make it have a certain amount of RAM and they'll beat the Apple phone in like every way. And somehow in the actual performance, the Apple phone ends up winning in a lot of these things because they designed it around things that actually mattered rather than designing it around, you know, a spec sheet that's gonna maybe sell that phone. I'm not the biggest Apple fan in the world, don't get me wrong. I'm hoping that Nintendo is kind of going in that direction, more so than trying to be so different that they're not even in the same generation in terms of of graphics. Yeah, so I think, I again, I would, my, my understanding and knowledge in working with those guys, and as I've said before, I think they're fantastic. I think you have got no worries there. And what you're really talking about from my perspective, when you're comparing iOS to Apple, is with Apple, aesthetics matter. How things look, how things feel, how things are animated. Work gets put in beyond just performance. Where Android, and I have some Android devices, I have some iOS devices, so, but I, I, I personally love Apple and got a, I've been moving more and more towards them, but, <laughs> um, but I do have both. But the bottom line is with Nintendo, making games is like a craft for them. And it is often the reason why you see fewer games. And they will take the time and make it really spend a lot of time on the craft and the aesthetic where a lot of groups just don't even care. The process is done. They get down the zero bugs. The game is out. That's it. And where they'll sit there and it'll be at zero bugs for a while and they'll go, hmm, how does this feel? And And they will look at things like that, which... And the way I would describe it in some sense is it gives a game a soul. And we need more groups like that rather rather than the other way because we've got, a, we've got tons of the other ones. So Yeah, for sure. Well, let's talk a little bit maybe about your experiences with Two Human on mm. the Xbox 360. Because I okay. know that started as a GameCube game. And yep. I was uh, really looking forward to it. I was devastated. <laughs> oh, when you, well, when you guys, actually, uh, I know what what happened there. Was Nintendo <laughs> literally not willing to to basically fund your type of game anymore? No, Is that no, what happened? There was nothing like that. Nothing like that at all. Not even not even close. Let me uh, make sure that everyone sort of understands. So the history of Two Human, Two Human, the concept for Two Human was created at the same time as Legacy of King. Matter of fact, proposals were done by me within the same week. So we were actually, there was actually a PlayStation version being developed with MGM at the time. And then when we were, when Nintendo invested in us, that was stopped and we moved all our IP to Nintendo. And then that's when you saw some of the GameCube, I guess, R&D. So we're doing research and development for T-Human on the GameCube while we're working on the N64 version of Eternal Darkness. And what happened was when we had to move Eternal Darkness over to the GameCube, we took all that research and technology that we we're doing on the GameCube and built the engine for Eternal Darkness. So a lot of the things that we put into to Human for the GameCube went into Eternal Darkness, all the camera stuff. And, and so as the GameCube era was ending, 
and they're moving towards the Wii. The type of games that Nintendo wanted to do were shorter, smaller, not story-driven games that, frankly, we had built the company around, Silicon Knights. It wasn't that Nintendo wasn't willing to fund it or anything like that. It was more around how do we work our kind of games into the direction they were going, like Mario Party and stuff like that, which was a direction they followed for quite a while. We just couldn't figure it out. They wanted to work with us. We wanted to work with them, but we couldn't figure out how. Yeah, so we regretfully, on both sides, parted way. I think you should have talked to me because I have the perfect solution for, for you guys at that time. You should have done a crazy Luigi's Mansion game with sanity effects. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you know, I'm older now and more experienced, and I, I think a suggestion like that is, is fantastic. Um, back in the day, I had to be pure to my art form, and for good or for ill, <laughs> it, it led to the way of me saying, I, I don't think I can make the kind of games that Nintendo wants us to make. And over time, Nintendo's shifted their perspective again back to the hardcore, and I think all the things that we do now fit perfectly with the direction that they're going. But back in the day, I, I, I couldn't see my way through it. And, you know, it's just one of those things that, you know, that happens. And <laughs> But they're, they're a great group. I, I love what they do. And I think they're very good for the industry. And I, I wish there were more groups like them, frankly. And uh, I think we got some good stuff coming uh, with the NX. We'll see. Thanks for tuning in to my first segment with Dennis Dyack of Quantum Entanglement Entertainment. I wanted to just remind you that he does have his own YouTube channel. And it goes by the name of The Quantum Tunnel. I will leave a link in the description below. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe.